Welcome to the Academic Writing Amplified Podcast. On this podcast, we believe that the culture of academia needs to change radically. Women and non-binary people are revolutionizing academia within institutions that were not built for us. If you're ready to reject the culture of overwork, kick guilt and overwhelm to the curb and amplify your voice to make a real impact on your field without breaking down or burning out, you're in the right place. With our team of experienced writing coaches as co-hosts, we'll share insights and talk to inspiring guests to bring you the practical strategies, systems, and mindset shifts you need to find time to write, publish work you love, and design your career on your terms. And it all starts with writing. Let's go. Welcome to this episode of Academic Writing Amplified. I'm Kathy, and I'm just popping in here to let you know to get ready, we are going to be opening the doors to our Navigate Your Writing Roadmap program really soon. Navigate is our program that helps you get those publications out the door. We figure out how you're going to make time to write, how you're going to organize your publication pipeline, and we give you all the tools and skills you need to get through that pile of almost done articles or stop sitting on that ton of data and get your publications out in the world and working for you and your career. Now, enrollment for Navigate is going to be open for a small window from November 25th to November 29th. But I want you, my favorite podcast listeners, to be able to participate in a really great bonus. And that bonus is our early bird New Year's writing retreat special for the first 15 people who enroll. So here's how it works. The wait list for Navigate is open. You can find the link in the show notes. And everybody's going to go join the wait list. So go do that right now. You can pause this episode, go join the wait list because on November 22nd, so that's like three whole days before everybody else, we are opening up Navigate enrollment to only the people on the wait list. And the first 15 people to enroll get to come to our New Year's writing retreat for free. This is a three-day writing retreat that we do at the end of January to infuse your 2023 with writing energy and joy and calm and all those things that we are are trying to create in the new year. So go get on the wait list. Then you'll be able to enroll on November 22nd. And the first 15 people to enroll get to come to our three-day virtual writing retreat in January for free. Okay, so go get on the wait list now. Hello, hello, listeners. This is Kathy Mazek, and I am so excited to host this week's podcast. In my recent podcast, I think it was episode 142 about quiet quitting, I talked about the agency that we have over our careers. I used this TikTok trend and a very, it's a very trendy word or phrase, I guess, for 2022. I used that to really take a look at our academic careers, right? And what can we, how can we think about shaping our careers into what we want them to be? And specifically, I wanted to emphasize, right? Like the agency that we have over our careers. Now, when I talk about this, like many professors are very hesitant to believe that they have as much agency over their careers as I'm purporting that you have. Of course, how we approach taking control of our careers is mitigated, first of all, by our like socialization inside of academia and our socialization in the world, right? And also by our identities, our institutional context, and really, right, our the sociocultural context in which we're living. So all of those things affect how individuals approach this idea of having agency and being able to take control of your career. So for example, someone in a very toxic department might feel extra social pressure to relax their time boundaries, to protect themselves from the critique of nasty colleagues, right? 
your intersecting identities also influence how you decide to push back against institutional cultural norms of overwork, for example. And this is something that we talk about or my clients talk about a lot in the monthly BIPOC circle meeting that we have for all of our clients that's run by our coach Thea. In our programs, particularly in Navigate Your Writing Roadmap, we walk clients through a process of taking agentive actions on their careers. We do so in order to make more room for a central aspect of what we do as professors, writing and publishing, right? This is super central to what we do, yet because we have difficulty taking control or taking these actions over our careers to protect our time, protect our writing. A lot of times the writing and publishing falls to the bottom of the list. In the process of walking clients through taking these actions, right? What we're really working on is getting clarity. When you're in our Navigate program, in the process of doing these agentive actions, right? What you're really working on is getting clarity on who you are as a scholar and what is important to you. You're learning about yourself and how you work best, and you're creating systems, processes, and boundaries to help you live your career with integrity and make decisions that center your academic mission and values. I like to call this career design. The concept that I call career design is called job crafting in the academic literature. It's also sometimes called job sculpting, but in academic papers, I've actually found job crafting to be the more agreed upon term. Now, I am not an expert on this, you know, from the research or academic perspective, but because I am a researcher and an academic, I've been digging into some papers about it. I've been reading some reviews and I'm super interested in applying this concept to what we do in our programs, particularly in Navigate. And so I hope that in this podcast, by really talking about this idea that that I think, right, that you can job craft your way to more publications, that you're going to... I hope be inspired, whether you enroll in our Navigate program or one of our other programs or not, I hope you'll be inspired to take some action over your career and really design it to be what you want it to be. So I've been, you know, in my corner teaching Navigate, you know, since 2017, but I didn't, well, even in 2017, I didn't call, I wasn't using the term career design. Right. I really was like, okay, I'm going to make this navigate program and it's going to be what I think you need to do in order to make time to write. Because that's what my colleagues were asking me. They're like, how are you teaching a 4 4 and still writing and publishing? And I was like, well, I'm going to kind of try to get all of that knowledge and what I actually did and all the processes into the format of a digital program that then other people can learn. Right. But I wasn't calling it career design then. I didn't start using the term career design until maybe a couple years ago during the pandemic sometime when I really started to realize that what we're doing when we're doing the processes inside of Navigate, what we're doing is shaping and designing, right? We're, we start with an academic mission statement and then we align everything that we do in our careers behind that and we plan out a publication pipeline in line with that mission statement that supports the mission statement. We learn how to manage our time so that our mission statement is the main thing that we're working on, right? The result of that is more publications. But that process, I started calling career design about, I don't know, a couple of years ago, 18 months or so. And then I heard a podcast, you know, I love podcasts. <laughs> and so I figured out that what I was calling career design was like a whole academic area of study called job crafting. And I figured that out or I, the little click went off in my head when I heard Dr. Amy Renuski on the Hidden Brain podcast. You can go look it up. It's the episode called You 2.0 Dream Jobs from July 30th, 2018. So it was like literally an old episode. <laughs> like I didn't listen to it in 2018. I, I listened to it fairly recently. And in that episode, she talks about how people often try to solve their problems at work by changing employers. 
And what ends up happening is that you just keep going and being unhappy at every employer that you go to. And also it's hard to get a job. So, <laughs> so this may not be the best way. So she suggests that there may be a better way to get more job satisfaction. And that is by proactively shaping your current job so that you are doing more of what you want to do, how you want to do it. In other words, job crafting. That's the academic term for it. So of course I went online and I started searching for papers by Dr. Amy Renewski and found a bunch. And I mean, I found not only like her work, but also review papers and that kind of thing. But I loved the way that that she and her colleagues talked about job crafting and defined it in a paper that came out of the Michigan Ross School of Business in 2008, actually, like came out 2007, revised in 2008. And it's a theory to practice briefing. So it's good because it's like very accessibly written. And this is by, I'll just read the researchers because I'm going to actually read quite a bit of the first paragraph just to give you like a good definition of job crafting. So the, the authors are Justin M. Berg, Jane E. Dutton, and then Amy Renewski. Okay, so my podcast editor is going to be mad because I'm going to shuffle papers, but I'm actually reading this paper for authentic, <laughs> authentic audio. All right, so on page one, under the core idea, I'm just going to read to you. This is a quote from the article, quote, job crafting captures what employees do to redesign their own jobs in ways that can foster job satisfaction, as well as engagement, resilience, and thriving at work. And then dot, 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 right? <laughs> a few sentences later, job crafting theory elaborates on classic job design theory that focuses on top-down processes of managers designing jobs for their employees, unquote. I love this because what they're saying here is that job crafting is like a bottom-up kind of practice, right? So this, again, most of these papers come out of business schools or organizational leadership kind of areas of study. And what they're really looking at is like these bottom up practices. And as like a, a, a linguistic anthropologist, I've always loved that. Like, I love the idea that that we can influence institutions and change norms, right? That actually humans are always doing that from kind of the bottom up. They go on to talk about like three different forms of job crafting. I'm just going to read them to you real quick because I want you to think about how these apply to your job, okay? And your job as a professor, right? So way number one, okay, quote, job crafters can alter the boundaries of their jobs by taking on more or fewer tasks, expanding or diminishing the scope of tasks, or changing how they perform tasks. Second, Job crafters can change their relationship at work by altering the nature or extent of their interactions with other people. And then third, job crafters can cognitively change their jobs by altering how they perceive tasks or thinking about the tasks involved in their jobs as a collective whole, as opposed to a set of separate tasks, unquote. So think about that, right? The first thing, altering the boundaries of your job. You get to say, this is as much as I'm going to take on. Mostly, I think for professors, well, not necessarily. I was get, You can alter the boundaries either way, right? Expanding the boundaries or reducing the boundaries. And I was going to say we normally want to reduce, but that's not true, right? Because maybe many, many of you listeners, what you want to do is actually alter the boundaries of your job, like expand them in order to include community-based work, for example. That's a good example, I think, for a professor. But then some others of you might want to reduce the boundaries of your job because you've been kind of just handed an area of your department that you really don't want or like tasks in your department that you feel are like out of your mission statement area. So you want to kind of back off on those. 
The second thing, right, that you change your relationship with work by altering the nature or extent of interactions with other people, right? So you get to really, this is where I think like community comes in. If you are proactively seeking community of like-minded values sharing professors, right? We've found, right, that that can increase your job satisfaction so much when you have a community of like-minded people and you're navigating that job together. And then third, you can cognitively change their jobs by altering your perception of tasks. And this is where, you know, in our world, we would talk about mindset, right? We would talk about how we think about the tasks and how we align them or not with our academic mission statement. One of the processes inside of Navigate that I feel is like, like really, really important is that sometimes you have tasks that are not in line with your academic mission statement. And they are also tasks that you can't quit. They've been assigned to you by somebody or Again, like maybe you have, I was just talking to a client who's in like a stripped back department where they're basically understaffed. There's not enough professors and there's a lot of service work. And so there's this like, we're in it together mentality that leads to if you draw a tighter boundary or you try to quit out of things, you know, you're going to be handing it to a colleague. So everybody's like a little bit afraid to say no because they know that we're all in this together and all we have is each other. So we need to kind of watch each other's backs, which is not like a bad culture of a department, but at the same time, what it leads to, right, is you having tests on your plate that you can't quit. So you could though look for ways to alter perceptions of those tasks or even alter the tasks themselves, right? By trying to pull the tasks more in line with your academic mission statement. But really like trying to think of creative ways of like aligning tasks that you can't quit with your mission statement. A lot of those are are perceptions. And I think related to perception so much is mindset, right? It's how do we think, for example, about writing, right? Like how do we think about writing? How do we think about publications? How can we alter our mindset around writing so that we elevate it? to the level of importance that publications have, right? Because so many times we're like, we need publications, but we're just letting the writing time, right? We're not putting it in our calendar. It's falling to the bottom of the list. We're doing binge and bust. And so what I'm suggesting is that you need to work on your writer's mindset so you can elevate that importance of writing. So that is, it is on par with the importance of your publications right? Which of course is logical, but we just don't think of it that way a lot of times. So now that you know a little tiny bit about what job crafting is, at least according to this group of researchers, I want to really apply it to our jobs as professors. I see a lot and I understand this completely. You know, a lot of our clients in our programs are unhappy in their job and They also know that the answer isn't like just finding another job, right? Because it's hard to just find another job. That doesn't mean it's not possible because we do coach people into other jobs. I just want to say that the first step should be job crafting. (laughs) The first step should be career design. If that doesn't work, then we can go. There's certain things, you know, that I, when I'm coaching people, I'm like, okay, this is something you could change. This is something you can work with versus like, this is an institution that's going to be a block for you eventually. So you got to figure out your exit plan. And for most people, the job crafting solves the problem. So just finding another job, you know, if you feel overworked and burn out in your current position is not actually the, you know, that's not usually even the first thought people have. The first thought that many of our clients have is, <sighs> there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Like that's what people think. There's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. There's a certain resignation around workload and also working nights and weekends and the binge and bust stress cycles as if they are like a really normal part of academia. Well, they're normalized, but they don't have to be normal. And if you are in a position in your job right now where you are feeling overwhelmed, you are 
having to work nights and weekends in order to quote unquote catch up, but you never catch up, right? And then what I mean by binge and bust stress cycles is like right now in a North American semester, you are in the binge. (laughs) You are like just trying to make it to the end of the semester so you can crash. That's the bust, right? (laughs) And all of that actually can be solved with job crafting or designing your career. So I'm not suggesting that job crafting or career design, as I like to call it, that this process is not as simple as just saying no to things. Okay. Saying no is a step, right? It's a step towards (laughs) job crafting, but it is not job crafting. Saying no is usually what people tell you when you are feeling overwhelmed and you're usually not doing it until you are overwhelmed, right? So there's this like realization that happens where you're like, oh, I really need to say no more, but you're already at a point where it's too much. So job crafting is way more proactive than that. Like saying no is a little, it's not totally reactive and there's definitely like proactive ways to say no or to make sure that not extra things that are unaligned with your mission, like get onto your plate. But I want to emphasize that saying no is not enough, that job crafting is indeed a process which involves careful reflection, self-exploration, and skills around time management and boundary setting. Those are skills that can be developed. They are learnable. All of this is learnable. It's not something that some people have and some people don't. It is definitely something that some people develop on their own. But in Navigate, we have distilled this process into 10 modules where you can learn it and apply it to your career very step by step. So again, what I'm suggesting here is that for many of the typical problems of the academic career, And especially for those of you who are sitting on a pile of half done articles or have a clogged up pipeline or who are experiencing this like rush of writing and then a crash and rush of writing and then a crash a couple times a year, you save up your writing for your holiday break or your semester break, and then you never get to rest and it just leads. So this is like the cycle of burnout. That is, I think, very common inside of academia. All of that can be alleviated by job crafting or like, as I say, designing your career. So if you want more publications, the solution is job crafting. A lot of times people who have like a 4.4 or even a 5.5 are looking at like people at an R1 and they're like, oh, that would be so great because they only teach a 1.1 or a 2.0 or whatever. Their load, and when I say that, just in case you haven't heard that terminology before, all of that refers to number of courses you teach each semester. And a lot of people, when you say a 4-4, it means like that you have a two-semester system and you teach four courses each term, right, or each semester. So a lot of times, people who have a heavy teaching load are looking over and like, wow, I wish I was at a place that they would buy out my time or that I wouldn't have such a heavy teaching load. Then I would be able to write. But let me tell you, because I work with people in all kinds of institutions, including a lot of people at R1s, the same problems exist. Like not teaching does not solve the publication problem. That is not the only solution or like the magical solution. And I'll give you another kind of evidence of this, right? Like when you have a sabbatical and I've got a podcast episode about this that was really popular about how to plan your sabbatical. I forget what number it is, but you can go back and search around. Just search Kathy Mazek sabbatical plan or something. And it really like, you know, how many people have gone on a sabbatical and what they're supposed to do on the sabbatical is clear their pipeline or write their book and it doesn't happen. And that's because, that's because they haven't done the process of job crafting, right? And so by the time they get to their sabbatical, they're so exhausted. They spend a lot of time trying to replenish their creative, their fountains of creativity and will to work. And then they run out of time to write. (laughs) And so all of that, in my opinion, can be solved by job crafting. Okay. So 
When I created the first version of our Navigate process in 2017, I made a very deliberate decision to use writing and publication as the entry point into this career design or job crafting process that I'm talking about. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that the effects of not designing your career or being resigned to the overwork, the long hours, the glorification of busy, all of that, One of the effects of this is that you aren't publishing. So again, people who are sitting on tons of data or a bunch of almost done articles are watching their tenure clocks tick or grant opportunities pass them by and they're thinking, I have a writing and publication problem, right? That's kind of like the way that your job crafting problem manifests itself. So writing and publication is an entry point into improving your career that maybe people can understand and are feeling in like a very raw, intense way. So reason number one for using writing and publishing as the entry point into career design or job crafting is that it is top of mind for many professors, right? Like this is how the job crafting problem or the lack of career design manifests itself. Another reason for using writing and publishing as the entry point into career design is that writing is an organizer for your career, or it can be, right? If you do this job crafting or career design process. So many of the moves that you have to make in our career design process, you can make by centering writing. So crafting your publication pipeline is a process of crafting your scholarly identity. So you have to get really clear on what you want that scholarly identity to be so that your pipeline can match it, right? To get publications out, you need writing time. So creating that time needs up-leveled time management and project management skills. And focusing on writing and publication is focusing on you, who you are, who you want to be, and the impact you want to make in the world. So using writing and publishing as the entry point into career design just makes sense. And I'm going to take the opportunity to tell you what our 10 systems for career design for more publications or job crafting your way to more publications. I'm going to take the time now to just tell you what these 10 systems are. I'm going to give you the high level overview. This lets you see, not only lets you see, okay, is navigate something I want to do, right? So some of you listening might be wanting to participate in our next round of the program that enrolls coming soon. I'm going to give you some details about that at the end of this episode. But also, even if you're not ever going to enroll and you're just going to listen, these 10 systems, you know, write these down. (laughs) They are the 10 systems, the 10 areas of your career that you need to work on as you job craft. Okay, so let's start with system number one. All right, as you might have guessed, (laughs) system number one is, we call it the mission method. And this is where you are going to write an academic mission statement using our template. And you're going to learn about how to make mission-based decisions. We have a flow chart. We have lots of tools. This first system is really the key to getting very, very clear about who you want to be in academia and what you want your career to be about. Okay. System two is the famous activities alignment. So we provide you with a series of activity alignment rubrics that you use in order to do this rather painful, I will admit, but totally necessary process of aligning your activities with your mission statement. One of the reasons you feel pulled in a thousand directions, one of the reasons where you're like so harried that you don't have time to write and then your publications get stalled out is that your career feels like it's about too many things. And once you have a mission statement and you start trying to pull everything in alignment with the mission statement, your career starts to feel about one thing, which is your academic mission. So that's why we do this process. Basically, we have a series of rubrics and we guide you in the program through this process of like, what am I going to keep? What am I going to cut? And then again, like I mentioned before in this episode, how am I going to align? How am I going to pull an activity that maybe I can't cut, like a course that I have to teach? How can I pull it closer to my academic mission statement? So 
we're really like culling the creep and having a plan of action as to how you are going to get things off your plate that no longer align with your mission. System three is freeing time. Okay. So now that you've got a clear idea of what your academic mission statement is, you've already started to pull things out of your schedule and make your whole career feel better by aligning it behind your academic mission statement. Now you need to really learn some great time management skills for being a professor, which is not easy, right? Like it's, it's very time consuming as a job. So we provide you in Navigate with done for you systems and processes for email, for teaching, for student management, for meetings. That's where we do our ideal week. You can go back to episode, I don't know, it's like episode two or three. I actually teach the ideal week for free (laughs) on this podcast. So you can go find that if you want to get a taste of it. But basically freeing time is all about time management. And that's system number three. So you start to get spaciousness in your schedule through that process that we take you through. And again, all of this is job crafting, right? This is, if you go back to the definition of job crafting, it's what employees do to redesign their own jobs in ways that can foster job satisfaction, as well as engagement, resilience, and thriving at work. So this is it, right? (laughs) Like that's what we're doing. System four, we teach you our writing systems and we call this soaring versus slogging. And we teach you this kind of combination of different writing techniques in order to make sure that you are using your best energy and all the resources available to you in order to get your publications out the door. So you're going to be having time to write because you're going to learn how to keep a date with your writing, like how to set that date with your writing, how to keep your boundaries around your writing time. We don't teach a write every day method because I find that to be very difficult to sustain, but we do teach how are you going to you know, create a regular writing practice. And so there's different aspects of this. There's different tools. We teach you how to use those tools and those systems to create what works best for you. System five, we cutely call the right goals method, but right is spelled R-I-T-E. And we talk all about goal setting there. Like how do you set goals for your writing, right? And we talk about tracking your goals, creating reward systems, different kinds of writing goals and how they might be motivating for different kinds of people. And then you'll know that about yourself. So we really learned the important skill of setting goals that you can hit, which is really, really important to creating momentum around your writing and a positive relationship with your writing, which so much of this program is about creating that positive relationship with your writing. If right now you're feeling like your writing is a slog, if you feel like, I don't even want to think about it, I don't want to open the document, all of those feelings, these processes, especially system three, four, and five, and six really, are going to help you to, you know, maybe rekindle what you lost when academia has like drummed the joy out of writing for you. These systems and processes help you rekindle that. And again, this is job crafting. This is putting an emphasis on developing more the areas of your career that you want to develop. It's agentive work. You're like, I'm going to decide that restoring my faith in myself as a writer and getting publications into the world, I'm going to decide that that's important for my career. And I'm going to, you know, alter the boundaries of my job or what are some of these other things, right? Change your relationships at work or alter my perspective, right? These are all aspects of job crafting in order to make those things shine and to have more satisfaction and joy in my work. System six is mindset mastery. And we do a lot of mindset work inside of Navigate. It is really helpful (laughs) to realize that the way that we think about our writing is going to help us become more productive writers and lead to better publications. So again, like I kind of mentioned before, the joy of writing has been kind of beat out of us inside of academia where so much writing is about judgment rather than the 
joy of writing and expressing ideas and writing in order to come to an idea, right? And so we really need to work on writing mindsets so that we don't get so much in our own heads that we shut down ourselves as writers, which of course leads to no publications. (laughs) The last few systems are much more publication focused because of course, like I said, writing and publishing both need to happen. We need to have the writing to get to the publications, but also like we really need to develop these project management skills so that we can handle writing multiple things at once, plus teaching, plus service and all the things, right? So system seven is called the project prediction plan. And I always say being predictable is better than being fast. So we are trying to help you create systems for how you work and kind of helping you reflect on those systems and really know what is working for you so that you can estimate your time to task, right? Like how long it takes you to do a task and just generally like how you can become a better project manager with your writing so that you know all the time where your writing is and you don't keep having this like never checked off to-do list, right? Like these things that like keep hanging on and hanging on. So project management, super important in system seven. System eight is one of my favorites. It's the power pipeline. Again, we're aligning your pipeline with your mission statement. We're really getting to intimately know the process that is your publication pipeline. So how your publications go from idea all the way to submitted article and accepted article, right? And so that process is also really a project management process, but it's also... The idea here is like, what are you keeping? What are you letting go? We have this concept of it's a pipeline, not a funnel. We're not going to cram every possible publication into the pipeline, but rather you're going to create a curated pipeline. I call this the power pipeline method, and it really helps you get your publications flowing through the pipeline. So you figure out where they normally get stuck or where they usually get stuck for you. And then you can use the tools you've developed in the other systems to move things through stuck points in your publication pipeline. System nine is about creating a year long writing roadmap. We teach you our, we call it our three by three by three writing planning process that you can do at the beginning. I would say the beginning of each semester, if you're on a semester system, every trimester, if you're on a trimester system, but basically every three to four months, you can kind of re readjust your year long writing plan. So we want you to have a plan, but we also don't want you to like freak out if you're not hitting the plan. Part of learning at planning is learning how to readjust and when. And then the final system in Navigate is our five-year framework where we do ask you to kind of dream out into the future and then reverse engineer a little bit. What do you need to be doing today so that you're setting yourself up for who you want to be in your career five years from now? So all of this is really a process of taking agentive action over your career. And that's why I really, when I heard that podcast on the Hidden Brain podcast, I was just like, this is, this is what we do inside of Navigate. We absolutely do it more deeply inside of our other programs, our Elevate program specifically, but this is the first step and it is a very powerful one. So before I tell you all the details about how you can join our next round of Navigate, if you would like, I want to circle back to the literature on job crafting. So the reason that there is academic literature about job crafting is that what people have found is that job crafting can lead to better retention. Okay, so instead of an employee who is really great employee leaving a job, instead they do this job crafting and then they stay. And they're not searching for satisfaction by changing jobs. They're creating satisfaction inside the job that they have. And that's retention, right? And of course, like managerial schools of business and organizational change and all those fields, that's something that's really important, right? Is that businesses can retain their best employees. And it also is very important for universities to retain their faculty. Now, I've talked about this on the podcast before. I think that 
even though it feels sometimes like the university with the tenure process, especially for those of us who go through the tenure process, sometimes it feels like the university is trying to push you out through the tenure and promotion process. But actually, the university is in the university's best interest to retain you. They have already invested a lot of money in recruiting you, finding you, recruiting you and all of that. And in nurturing you, whether it feels like nurture or not, (laughs) for the years that you've been there, they are going to be losing a lot if they don't retain you. And of course, also, we want these best professors to stay. Like we want to be able to make the professor job a job that exactly the people who are going to take us into like the next level of higher ed and the future of higher ed, like those are the people that the job is pushing out. (laughs) And so if we can do this kind of bottom up job crafting, I think it could be really powerful for the professorate and for the future of higher education. We also know from the literature that job crafting leads to greater job satisfaction, which is what you want, right? Like this is what you want. This is what we want for you. You want to feel happy and satisfied in your job, not overworked and burnt out. So job crafting is really good for everyone, right? It's good for you. It's good for your university. And so this idea of job crafting is something I really want you, everybody listening to think about. So most importantly, career design, job crafting, the way we teach it and navigate will get your publications out the door. That's the bottom line, right? Or that's not the bottom line. The bottom line, I think, is actually the job satisfaction. But I know that you getting your publications out the door is something that you want. And if job crafting can get you there, then I think that our Navigate program is a great first step in that direction. All right, that's the end of this week's podcast. I want to encourage you that if you're even just a little bit interested in starting our Navigate program, enrollment opens from Black Friday through the Tuesday after. So there's a very small window of enrollment And we just can't wait to get started. We're just, we can't wait. (laughs) If you're interested, we encourage you to get on our wait list. The link to the wait list is in the show notes. And here's why you want to join the wait list. (laughs) If you join the wait list, you get early access to register. That will open on Tuesday, November 22nd. And the reason you want early access to register is because the first 15 people who sign up for our next round of Navigate will get a free ticket to our two and a half day New Year's writing retreat in January. Now, this is a virtual retreat. We send you a gift box in the mail to make it feel a lot more retreaty. And even though it's virtual, our clients rave about it. This is a event that we do only for our Amplify and Elevate clients. So our high level coaching clients. But we let the first 15 people who sign up for Navigate during our November launch We let those first 15 people in for free. It's such a great bonus. It's worth like at least $2,500. That's what online writing retreats cost these days. So we are just so looking forward to welcoming you into our new Navigate group. So make sure you get on the wait list because when the doors open, you want to be the first one to sign up. Have a great day and thanks for listening. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Academic Writing Amplified. I'm just popping in here at the end to remind you that our program, Navigate Your Writing Roadmap, is going to be open for enrollment from November 25th through 29th. But I have a secret special deal for all of our biggest podcast fans, and that is that we are opening the doors early with a special bonus. So you'll find the wait list for Navigate. You'll find the link here in the show notes of the podcast. And if you go ahead and get your name on the wait list, then we are going to be opening the doors to navigate just to the wait list for early birds to enroll on November 22nd. Now, the reason you want to do this is that the first 15 people who enroll in Navigate this year are going to get a free chance to come or a free ticket to come to our New Year's writing retreat in the end of January. This is an amazing three-day virtual retreat. You can enjoy it from the comfort of your home. 
and we make it really special, is a really great way to kind of get your writer's mindset on track for 2023. And we love to see some of our new Navigate members there. So find out about Navigate by going to the link in the show notes. Go ahead and get on the wait list and you'll have the chance to come to our New Year's writing retreat for free. All right, go get on the wait list now. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time supporting yourself and your writing by listening to this episode. If you like what you heard today, the best way to say thank you is to hop on over to Apple iTunes and write an honest review. The more reviews, the more amazing academic women and non-binary people will find this podcast. So go write one now.